discoveries you probably didn't hear about this week. Worried about catching germs? Well, check out what they're catching. This is a bacterial cell harpooning a piece of DNA. It's the first direct observation ever of this key step in how bacteria rapidly evolve new traits. The DNA fragments become part of the bacteria's genome. It's called DNA uptake, or horizontal gene transfer. This new observation method involving glowing dyes will help scientists working to thwart the spread of drug resistance between species. From desert air to drinkable water, this new water harvester sucks water molecules out of dry air, running on nothing but sunlight. The key is a highly porous material called metal organic framework. The powder absorbs water molecules at night, then sunlight drives them out to be condensed and collected. About three ounces of water for every pound of powder, but improvements are on the way. These days we're connecting our wearables, medical devices, cars, and pieces of household tech to the Internet of Things by the billions. But those wireless devices are vulnerable to hacking. Now researchers have developed a way to send each data bit, each one or zero, on a random radio frequency channel, hopping frequencies every microsecond to protect signals from being intercepted or jammed. Nope, even the quickest hackers can't keep up. Want a winter forecast for LA? Check New Zealand. The New Zealand Index, that is. A new way to predict what kind of winter rainfall is in store for the U.S. Southwest. Crucial for the economy, water security, ecosystem management. And it all starts with temperature changes in the ocean near New Zealand in July and August. Turns out there's an inner hemispheric bridge that influences the winter U.S. jet stream. And the New Zealand Index, or NZI, could become a better predictor than El Nino. And there you go. See you next week with four more awesome discoveries with funding from NSF. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so you know when we post. So traditionally, most of what we know about sea turtles come from the nesting beaches. That's where we have easy access to the animals. Females come up on these tropical beaches and lay their eggs in warm sand. And the female green sea turtle, for example, will lay about 100 ping pong ball size eggs. And she may lay two to eight nests within a season. However, the number of nesting females on a nesting beach is not always a good measurement of the overall health of a population. Today, conditions on nesting beaches are changing, and we're seeing a general trend of warming now. One of the really interesting things about sea turtle is that their sex is determined by the incubation temperatures of the eggs, with cooler temperatures producing more males and warmer temperatures producing more females. With only a few degrees, can really alter the sex ratios of turtles' hatchlings. We don't know a lot about sea turtle sex ratios, so it's really important to get that data to help us determine the abundance of the population, the sex ratio, the survivorship of different sexes. But figuring out the sex of sea turtles is not easy. One of the big challenges that we have is that there's no physical characteristics that can be used to determine the sex of a sea turtle until it reaches sexual maturity, which is when the males develop a longer tail than the females. Most studies rely on measuring the temperature of nests to estimate the sex ratios that would have been produced given those temperatures. Another approach is to look at the sex ratios of sea turtles at a foraging ground. The foraging grounds give us a unique opportunity to look at the overall population because it's many years of different turtles being born on different nesting beaches which come to these foraging grounds. So you have immature turtles, which can be anywhere from 2 to 20 years old, and then you have mature turtles, which are generally 25 to up to 50 years old. So this work is done in strong collaboration with the Australian government, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife, and the foraging ground that we studied is called the Howard Group. It sits in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. And from previous research we've done, we know that 90% of the turtles originate from the two Great Bear Reef populations with roughly a 50-50% split. So a typical day in the field, we catch somewhere between 70 to 100 green turtles in a day. After the turtle is caught, we take it back to the boat, Thank we you. measure and tag it. We also take a blood sample that we use to find out whether it's a male or a female. And then we take a small tissue sample that we use for genetics to find out which nesting population these turtles belong to. 
what's quite unique about what we're doing is that once we apply the genetics and we can estimate the nesting origin of these turtles, we can actually calculate nesting population specific sex ratios for different size classes. So one of the surprising things that we found in this study was that the overall sex ratios at the foraging ground wasn't that alarming. It was slightly female biased. But it wasn't until we applied the genetics that we saw that the turtles coming from the cooler southern nesting beaches were only moderately female biased with about 65% female. However, the turtles coming from the warmer northern nesting beaches, we found this extreme female bias of 99% or more females in the young turtles, which means that virtually no male turtles were born from these nesting beaches. So this information was unknown until now. Nobody's combined these techniques before to figure this out. And most sea turtles reach sexual maturity around 25 years old. And the immature turtles that we examined for this study are probably at least five years old. So we're thinking that we'll start to see this feminization of the populations coming into full effect about 20 years from now. However, a few male turtles really goes a long way because male turtles are polygonous, which means that they can mate with several females. It's important to remember that they've been around for 100 million years, they've outlasted the dinosaurs, and they've adapted to a changing climate through that whole time. However, the climate is changing faster now than it has ever. And so the questions that we're all asking is, will it be able to adapt, and, and will it be able to adapt fast enough? And I certainly hope so. This spring, aboard NOAA's ship Okeanos Explorer, scientists set out to explore the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, includes depths to, down to about 4,000 meters, uh, so these include areas that have never been surveyed. Thousands of feet below the surface, among gas seeps and mud volcanoes, the daily drama of competition plays out on pieces of our past. At another site, the team explored a wreck thought to be the new hope, a tug lost in 1965 during Tropical Storm Debbie. Uh, maps from industry showed uh, something that looked like an, uh, a shipwreck, and uh, today is the first uh, scientific uh, archaeological survey of the site. The seven-member crew abandoned the foundering vessel boarding a life raft in 20-foot seas to await help that arrived four hours later. All seven survived the ordeal. In addition to several shipwrecks, the researchers explored and documented canyons, the Gulf's geology, Coral communities, species never seen before in the Gulf, and gas seeps that support chemosynthetic organisms. Like these deep sea mussels, nourished by intracellular bacteria that convert gases from the seeps into nutrients. Indeed, the team witnessed wonders not seen every day. We, as humans, 
are inextricably connected to our ocean. It is our planet's lifeblood. Many may not think much of our ocean, but it's with us every day. It provides our food and the oxygen we breathe. It regulates our climate and shapes our coastline. It holds countless secrets that are yet to be uncovered. I'm Vernon Smith. Join me as we discover and explore the diversity of people, places, and jobs across NOAA's National Ocean Service. As the nation's premier ocean protection agency, NOAA's National Ocean Service is a community of people with diverse skills. We are protectors. We are chart makers. We are navigators, scientists, emergency responders, IT specialists, surveyors, analysts, collaborators, and partners. We are educators and we are interpreters. We support coastal communities and prepare them for changing ocean conditions. We help navigate our nation's waterways. We respond to disasters and we protect the treasures of our ocean and Great Lakes. We are the eyes on the ocean and it is our observations that position America's communities, economies, and ecosystems for the future. America's history has been driven by the ocean. Our nation has been shaped by epic tides and currents that have swept along our shores. The ocean belongs to all of us. Within our waters, you will find thousands of different species of marine organisms. You will find diverse ecosystems from open ocean to coral reefs, kelp forests to tide pools. The ocean gives us a vast and varied bounty from navigable waterways to scientific wonder. And the ocean connects us. The rivers that start as mountaintop streams flow to thriving estuaries which become our seas. And in turn, as a diverse workforce, it's up to us to care for our nation's waters. Today, not only do we promote safe navigation and commerce, but we provide cutting edge science, support the management of coastal communities, foster stewardship in a diverse public, and protect our natural places for future generations. America's demographics are changing and the way we engage with the ocean will shift with it. To effectively care for and support our nation's waters, our National Ocean Service approaches the ocean from diverse perspectives. We look to the future. We provide scholarships and mentorships we partner with universities, museums, nonprofits, and parks. Through these opportunities, we support the next generation who will care for our nation's waterways. To meet the needs of tomorrow, to remain relevant to the ocean of the future, the National Ocean Service is investing in our people, our places, our communities, and a workforce as diverse as the ocean we support. We are your National Ocean Service. The third meeting of the National Space Council, seeking a partnership to power our gateway and an educational activity that's quite a blast. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. 
Administrator Jim Bridenstine attended the third meeting of the National Space Council June 18th at the White House. President Trump opened the meeting by signing Space Policy Directive 3, which directs the U.S. to lead space traffic management and mitigate the effects of space debris. During the meeting, which was led by Vice President Mike Pence, Bridenstine reported on NASA's progress in implementing Space Policy Directive 1, which directs NASA to return U.S. astronauts to the moon and eventually send humans to Mars. The architecture that we're building now is entirely different than any architecture we've ever built before in an effort to get to the moon. And the reason is we have more capabilities now than we've ever had as a nation. On June 21st, we announced plans to seek a public-private industry partnership for a high-power solar electric propulsion spacecraft to provide power, controls, and communications for the first element of our planned lunar exploration platform known as the Gateway. Built with commercial and international partners, the Gateway will become the orbital outpost for robotic and human exploration operations on and near the moon and beyond, including Mars. This is our opportunity to have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. When you land on the surface of the moon, you're in one spot on the surface of the moon. But what we want is we want access to the entire moon. A new multi-agency report released June 20th details plans for the U.S. response to near-Earth objects that could pose a hazard to Earth. Titled National Near-Earth Object Preparedness Strategy and Action Plan, the document identifies actions to enhance the federal government's coordination and preparedness posture during the next 10 years to address potential hazards posed by near-Earth objects. For information about NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, visit nasa.gov slash planetary defense. Our Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia held its annual Rocket Week June 15th through 22nd. It's an opportunity for students and instructors from across the country to learn more about rocketry basics and build experiments for flying on a NASA suborbital rocket through the Rock On and Rock Sat C programs. Rocket Week is one of many events we sponsor to stimulate student interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM careers. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. I decided to become a corpsman because I wanted to be something bigger than myself. Anywhere you look across the world, you see, you see that running to you when you really need them, that, you see that Red Cross or that Caduce on whoever it is, uh, foreigners or American, you know, it means something. Just speaking from my own personal experience, you're, you're just moving. It's not something that's really driving you. All you know is that, you know, your brother's down. That's your family. And in the day, if you don't do what your job is to do, you know, someone's gonna die. So, just knowing that I have those brothers by my side, and knowing that I have my, uh, the closest family I've probably ever had to my actual I family, uh, I did everything I could to make sure they made it home alive. That make sure that I could say, hey, like, you're okay. Everything's fine. Hold the care of the sick and injured to be a privilege and sacred trust. And will assist the medical officer with loyalty and honesty will not knowingly permit harm to come to any patient. I will not partake of nor administer any unauthorized medication. I will hold all personal matters pertaining to the private lives of patients in strict confidence. I dedicate my heart, mind, and strength to the work before me and shall do all within my power. To show in myself an example of all that is honorable and good throughout my naval career. In 2017, a colossal chunk of ice roughly the size of the state of Delaware broke away from an ice shelf on the Antarctic Peninsula. The peninsula is warming at rates much greater than the rest of the planet, leading to large losses of sea ice, prime habitat for minke whales, krill, which feed on algae and phytoplankton that grow on the underside of sea ice, serve as the main food for minkies. 
What will happen to krill-dependent animals and their ecological roles if sea ice disappears? This year, scientists from the National Science Foundation, UC Santa Cruz, Duke, Stanford, and NOAA traveled to the Antarctic Peninsula to study the case of minke whales. Using underwater echo sounders, drone photography, and whale-mounted video cameras designed to fall off the whales after a day or two, the team tracked the movements and feeding of the whales. Dr. Chris Taylor with NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science led the krill mapping using echo sounders to measure the location and size of krill swarms the minkies fed on. The information collected by the researchers is giving them a better idea of how much minke whale feeding occurs under sea ice, and ultimately of how climate change might affect this polar region. My name is Lindsay Draper, and I'm a physician and a postdoctoral research fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Christian Henricks, where we study T-cell immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is studying the body's own immune system to fight off diseases. I have been interested in cancer research for a very long time. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 31. I was very young at the time. I don't remember too much about it, but I remember that it was awful. Moving forward to high school, I was encouraged by one of my biology teachers to pursue an internship at the National Cancer Institute. And this was an amazing experience that opened up the world for me. And after college, I wanted to further dive into this world of cancer research. My goal is mainly to identify T cell receptors, which are some of our white blood cells in our immune system that we know are able to fight off cancers. Every person has a unique set of T cell receptors that can recognize viral proteins, cancer cells, among other things. So the initial round of experiments would be to identify a group of white blood cells that are recognizing and killing tumor cells in a petri dish. And from there, I can better characterize that. Um, I can get the genetic sequence of the T cell receptor that we have found and move toward a clinical trial. The fascinating thing about working at the National Cancer Institute, our patients are in the same building as our laboratories. I get to see the full spectrum of the work. I think that patients should know that when they sign up for a clinical trial, they're not only fighting their own cancer, but they're fighting cancer in many, many other people as well. We have developed entire clinical trials based on information we've, we've learned from one patient who enrolled in a trial. And it's just amazing the number of people that she's helped and will continue to help. The patients definitely inspire me and keep me working hard. They come with their families from across the country, brave, full of hope, ready for these trials, and their dedication both to, to fighting their personal fight and also contributing to our understanding of their disease process so that we can help others is, is just incredible. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER. The Defense Language Institute provides language training to military personnel so that they can conduct operations. At the Information Warfare Training Command, we also provide sailor professionalization to enhance their language training so that they conduct operations out in the fleet. Back in 1941, it was recognized that we needed a foreign language capability within our armed forces, and so the first language school was uh, developed up at Chrissy Field with Presidio of San Francisco. And during the World War II period, the school moved a couple times. And then after World War II, the school finally settled here at the Presidio of Monterey, where it remains today. Marhaba, Ismiri. Kifak. Privyet. Nihao. Nihao. Marhaban. Salam. Privyet. Zdrasvoj. Marhaba. 
سلام اسم من هستیه من در نیروی دریایی هستم و این مدرسه زبان فارسیه I always thought it was really cool when other people spoke different languages. I'm from Southern California, so most people are bilingual. And in high school, we had to take Spanish, but it wasn't really something that I got too into. But yeah, I had no idea what Farsi was. I didn't even know like where they, where they spoke that before I got here. The language training ranges anywhere from nine months to 64 weeks, depending on the difficulty of the language. We have them in class about seven to nine hours a day. And then after that, they can have up to three hours of homework. And that's not even including the study time. So study time, one to two hours on top of three hours of homework. Um, they have to fit that in between their PT schedules and any other requirements, which is GMTs that we have for them. It's all about time management here and really being motivated to keep up that drive. Especially now that we're in third semester, we're not supposed to speak English in the halls. We're not supposed to speak English in the classrooms. So um, they kind of force you to be comfortable with speaking the language. So as CTIs, um, we are at the forefront of intelligence gathering, both at the point of collection and the point of dissemination. So information warfare is what we specialize in. And every day we are reminded by our CO here that we are here to deliver a war fighting skill, not just to teach a language. How much would you pack for a trip to Mars? Astronauts will need a lot of stuff to survive the long journey there and back, but with current technology, it would take up way too much space. Scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley are on the case. They're studying special bacteria called exoelectrogens that may be able to help. These bacteria can generate electricity in tiny wires they grow out of their cells. This makes them really handy because, with some clever engineering, they could be used to clean water and produce energy and supplies that astronauts need. But scientists don't know how well they grow in space or if they can do all their cool tricks up there. To find out, they're sending some of these electricity-producing bacteria to the International Space Station where they'll be grown and tested in many different conditions. The data the scientists get back will help lay the groundwork for future, better life support systems and the first long-duration human missions out into the solar system. Thank <laughs> you.